Welcome back to Law News Network. I'm Heather Hansen, and we are on our lunch break from the Jeffrey Willis case after a very interesting and exciting morning. I am happy to have a guest with me here on this lunch break. We have Ron Blitzer, uh, one of our own here from Law News Network. So good to have you here. Great to be here. I know you've been following this case and writing it up for the website. What do you think about the fact that we're really seeing evidence in three different cases being presented in this one case, Ron? It's not something that uh, you're really used to seeing. Uh, normally, uh, evidence from other incidents, other cases are not allowed in a trial, uh, but this is a very special case. Uh, we heard testimony earlier today from a teenage girl. She was 16 at the time last year where she was allegedly abducted by Jeffrey Willis. She escaped from the moving van and reported this to law enforcement who then started investigating him and that's what led to all of this now connecting him to the Rebecca Bletch murder and to another disappearance and murder of uh, Jessica Haringa. That's a separate trial. Uh, but it was important to get this information, this testimony from this teenager in this case because that's how law enforcement officers were able to connect Willis to Bletch. It was during the investigation of this kidnapping that uh, luckily for her didn't go as planned for mm -hmm. the kidnapper, uh, but it was when they were investigating her that they were able to find evidence, a gun in the van that was connected to shell casings in the Bletch murder. So without all of this, without this uh, young girl uh, identifying Jeffrey Willis and his van as being involved in her kidnapping, which then led to uh, the Bletch connection, the prosecutors wouldn't be able to go forward. So here you needed to establish this in order to go with this case. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, there's, first of all, as you said, it's very unusual for evidence of other crimes to get in. But here, there's no way to get around it because, as you said, it's sort of one step led to another, which led to this investigation. I was talking to Aaron Keller, one of our other hosts, yesterday about this, and we were both saying that, you know, oftentimes in these cases, you'll hear them testify, investigations led us to and they try to get around it. But it would be almost impossible to do that here, don't you think? Oh, absolutely, because you know the whole reason why Willis is tied to the Bletch murder uh, is because you know, this girl identified him as being the one who was with this, driving this van who you know, tried to abduct her. And without being able to identify him as being involved in that case, you can't say that he's the person who had the gun right. in that van yeah, that was this. connected to this case. I mean, there's just too much interwoven that can't be untangled. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like this. Yeah. And so to try to sort of pry it all apart without making, you know, with, without ruining the evidence, ripping it, if you, you know, would, it's almost impossible. Yeah, absolutely. Because you can say, oh, well, during this you know, unnamed investigation, we found evidence that connected this gun that was in this van. But then you say, well, how do we know that Willis was the guy who had the van? How do mm -hmm. we know that it was him? Well, this teenage girl said, this is the guy. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit more about this teenage girl, because I know when Kathy was on earlier this morning with Jesse, she talked about the girl's bravery in escaping the kidnapping, which uh, you can't be overstated. I mean, for a 16-year-old girl to have the wherewithal to be able to save her own life, and with the help of the woman who we saw testify next, is amazing. But then on top of that, to have to walk into that courtroom and face the man that not only tried to kidnap her, but now she knows has committed all of these other horrible crimes. I mean, goodness gracious, that girl, kudos to her, kudos to her family, kudos to, her, you know, she's really made a difference in, in, in what could be many women's lives because this guy's a danger. Absolutely, and let's not forget, early in her testimony, she said that she was coming back from a party, it was early in the morning, she admitted that she had been drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana, mm -hmm. so despite her potentially compromised state, she still had the presence of mind to 
open the door and roll out of a moving van when her life was in jeopardy. Yeah, and, and she had the wherewithal to admit to all of those things. You know, a lot of kids at that age, I think, would try to hide the fact that they were doing those things, which mm -hmm. could have compromised the investigation and compromised her on cross-examination. So, you know, I'm sure that it took a lot of family meetings and <laughs> um, discussion to get yeah. to the point where she was comfortable saying all of that. You know, when, when I was young, my mom always said, it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you tell us the truth, we'll help you through it. And that seems like what this family must have come together and, and said. Yes, and also, you know, for her to admit this in a courtroom, yeah. you know, she, you know, a lot of teenagers may not understand that, you know, it's okay to admit these things in these situations. Right, right. Uh, but if she didn't, and then it came out uh -huh. on the defense and say, oh, well, weren't you smoking this? Weren't you drinking Absolutely. that? Then that could impeach Huge. her credibility. But she's saying, no, this is what happened. Yeah, I did this. Yes, I did that. And then this happened to me. And this is what I did about it. And it doesn't leave a lot of room for cross-examination. No. She was, she was stellar, a, a, the hero. All these cases, we see some little silver linings. And she is the silver lining thus far in the Jeffrey Willis case. She's, she was just amazing from the time of the occurrence to her testimony today. Um, I couldn't have been more blown away by her. The defense attorneys have a difficult job in this case. I, you know, it's just, uh, and it's almost today when the defense attorney was cross-examining the Secret Service agent about Dodge Caravans, it almost was like he was like, how many Dodge Caravans? Are, like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like talking about caravans because he doesn't have a lot to yeah. work with. It's, um, I, I don't know, for me in some ways, when you have a case that's really difficult to defend, it's almost more... Um, I don't want to say fun, but it's almost easier because there's less pressure because you're expected to lose. But at the same time, I mean, what does he do with this? What, what would you do if you're defending this case, Ron? What would you do? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, you try to work towards poking holes in a witness's memory. Uh, you try to you know, say, oh, well, could it have happened this way? Try to get them to stumble as much as possible. Uh, you know, play up the fact that maybe they were impaired at the time. Mm -hmm. But again, it's very difficult in situations, especially in situations where you're questioning a witness who is the alleged victim of a kidnapping that could have been potentially a whole lot worse. So, you know, some, some of the questioning came off as a little ridiculous saying, oh, do you know what a syringe is? Do you know what a gun is? Can you tell the difference? Well, yes. Right, uh, right. And then, you know, fortunately, the defense attorney kind of left well enough alone after that and was like, all right, yeah. we're done here. There's just not. There's a, not a whole lot to do. There's not. Now, in his opening, it, it seemed as though there, there, there's going to try to be some establishment that it could have been Kevin Bloom. Um, and somehow he had some relationship with Kevin Blesh. So Kevin Bloom is the cousin of Willis. Yes. Kevin Blesh is the husband of the deceased victim. Yes. And there's try the defense has tried to establish some sort of relationship between the two Kevins. What do you think? Do you think they're going to be able to go anywhere with that? I'm not sure. Uh, I have not yet uh, seen where they plan on going with this, with that relationship. I, I do know that Yes, they're trying to pin this on uh, Kevin Bloom. Kevin Bloom just had a hearing yesterday in the the other trial that's related to right, all of this. Right. Uh, the other murder case that was you know broken open by this same teenage girl during the investigation of that. Not only did law enforcement officials connect Willis to the Rebecca Bletch murder, but also to the disappearance and murder of Jessica Haringa. Yeah. So Bloom faced the hearing in the Haringa case yesterday. Uh, was He was trying to get bail lowered, was trying to get some felony charges dismissed. The judge didn't go for that in uh, either situation. Right. Uh, but we'll see, that's gonna be a separate case at a separate time. Uh, but for now, we'll see if the defense is able to convince the jury that Bloom was more responsible for this and not Willis. Well, and one of the things that we just heard from the Secret Service agent, his name is Ron Harith, Heathius, I guess, um, Ryan Heathius. I, I thought that it was interesting, just as an aside, that Secret Service agents are sometimes involved in these types of investigations. You know, they help out locally when they can and when they have some special area of expertise. Apparently, this agent's area of expertise has to do with identification of cars. Um, but, you know, he, he definitely was helpful to the prosecution in saying that when looking at the cell phone records, there was nothing to tie those two Kevins together that they had any communication. Yeah, uh, I was surprised, you know, 
also to hear about a Secret Service uh, officer who's getting involved in this. Right. Uh, I haven't seen that too often, but where they're able to help, you know, as in this case, then it's great that they're able to do that Fabulous, and to yeah. work on identifying these vehicles. Yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting testimony. The other thing that I thought was interesting is at the end, right before we broke for lunch, the judge turns to the jury and talks about, you know, you're not supposed to talk about this with anyone, blah, blah. And then he mentioned that they, um, apparently someone's been on Facebook, some juror's been doing something on Facebook. If that's the case, if a juror is commenting on this case in Facebook, I am surprised that it was such sort of a throwaway line and not addressed in a different way. Are you? It depends on the situation. Uh, I didn't hear all of the comment very well. Uh, posting on social media about the case when you're a juror is definitely frowned upon. Uh, yes. I am surprised that the judge kept the juror if there's an alternate there waiting in the wings. Uh, but at the same time, I think that there may be a difference between posting on something and engaging in a conversation about something. You're not supposed to discuss the case mm -hmm. with other people. So. You know, if there were comments to that post and a back and forth, right. that would be a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. um, just posting something that is public record, anyone could sit in the courtroom and find these things out. Uh, maybe that's not as bad. I'm still not a fan of it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it depends on what's said. I mean, if the juror simply said, I'm going to be MIA for a little bit <laughs> <Right>. of time <laughs> because I'm on this big jury, then maybe that's excusable. Yeah. But it's definitely, you know, we see this more and more in my cases. Social media is now becoming a huge part of trials. It's part of the evidence. It's part of when you do jury selection. You know, there's oftentimes uh, attorneys have their associates sitting next to them doing searches of mm -hmm. their Facebook pages as they go through jury selection and now as the trial goes on I guess attorneys have to be checking to see that the jurors are not posting every single night it's uh, it's a huge part of cases huge part of life I guess yeah and it'll it's um, it's fascinating to think about where the the laws and the different rules for jurors may go from here as a result you know would jurors have to disclose their social media handles and allow access to attorneys and court officers in order to check up on them. That could be seen as a violation of privacy, but it could be seen as something that's necessary to keep things in order. Yeah, it's definitely, um, we're leaning towards that, I think. We're leaning towards the idea that, you know, we need to make sure that we, uh, what's your address and what's your, what's your Twitter address? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I want to do? I want to play, in case anyone missed it this morning, pieces of that minor's testimony, because as Ron and I have been talking about I mean, she's the hero of this case, and but for her, Willis may very well still be wandering the streets and causing real danger to a lot of women in that neighborhood. So, you know, she's the one that deserves the cover of People magazine if she's interested in it, and we want to play some of her testimony. We also want to take your questions if you have them. So while we play this testimony, send them on in through the chat rooms. I will do my best to grab them, and Ron and I will do our best to answer them after you see this clip. To a party. All right, and uh, where was that party at? Or I guess if you could describe in, in general kind of where you went and ultimately where you end, ended up. Well, I went to two parties. I don't remember where the first one was, but and then we had left and went to my friend Jalen's house and then went to a party on Green Creek. Okay, again, I gotta ask you to speak up just a little Sorry. bit. Sorry. Okay. You end up at a party at what location? Green Creek. Green Creek Road? Yes. Okay, now. I hate to ask you this, but I gotta ask you, were you drinking alcohol that night? Yes. And were you doing anything else? Smoked weed, marijuana. Smoked marijuana? Yes. Okay. Now, did you do any other drugs that night? No. All right. And uh, do you recall what you were wearing that night? Um, a striped shirt, tank top with a black pullover and jeans. And what kind of shoes were you wearing? Flowered, like... I don't know how to explain them. Okay. Open kind of. Open shoes? Yeah. Okay. And this is going to be a goofy question, but it'll, it'll be relevant here in a second. Did, do you remember if your fingernails were a certain color? Purple. Purple? Um, now, on Friday night, did you have some sort of plan on how you were going to get home? Yes. What was that? My friend Jake Hall. Your friend Jake Hall was going to take you home? Yes. And uh, did that plan work out? No. Why? Because his friend fell asleep in the car and locked the keys in the car. 
Okay. So your ride essentially kind of disappeared. Yes. What, uh, I guess as a result of that, what did you do? I started walking. Now, do you remember at all what time it was when you started walking? No. Do you remember if it was dark out, light out? Yeah, the sun was just coming up. The sun was just coming up? Yeah. And uh, do you recall at all the direction that you were walking uh, when you started walking? I know I took it right out of the driveway. Okay. <laughs> took it right out of the driveway. And do you remember what road you ended up at? Green Creek. All right. And from Green Creek, what road did you end up at? River. River? Yes. And do you remember at all, or recall at all, what direction on river you went? Right. Right? Yes. And I assume you just started walking. Yes. Now, uh, when you decided to walk or to go home, walk home, uh, were you drunk? No. Were you high? No. Did you have all your faculties about you? Yes. Um, at some point in time, well, let me ask you this. Did, did you have any idea where you were going? No. No. And at what point in time did you realize that you were lost? Uh, I don't really know. I really didn't know where I was going the whole time, so okay. kind of was lost. Okay. Uh, at some point in time, do you, run in, do, do you run into, not run literally, but do you run into somebody? Yes. What, describe that, please. He was riding his bike, and I stopped him to use his phone. And he pulled up maps, and then I asked to use to call my mother, and he went on the dial pad, and his phone died. And he told me yes. I was. Walking. You were still on river at this time. Yes. Okay. So can you describe for the jury, kind of emotionally, how how you're feeling? Scared. No, just wanted to get home. Didn't really know what to do. Were you upset? Yes. So. Knowing now that you were walking towards the lake, was that the direction that you wanted to go? No. All right, so what'd you do? Walked back from the way I was walking. All right, still on river? Yes. Okay. Now, at this point in time, you described as you started walking, the sun was just coming up. Can you describe what's happening at this point as far as daylight is concerned? All right, it was daylight out. Okay. And this is Saturday morning, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, at some point in time, as you were walking down river, are you approached by somebody else? Yes. Can you describe that for the jury, please? What happens? Um, I was walking in a car, a van pulled up and asked if I could, or if I needed a lift, and I asked to use his cell phone. All right, I'm going to stop you right there for just a second. Did this van come, like, towards you or from From behind, behind me. And, uh... When the van pulled up, uh, did it pull right next to you? Yes. And do you remember what color it was? Silver. And uh, was there, how many people were in the car? One. So nobody in the passenger seat? No. Nobody in the drive, or in the uh, back area? No. And was this one person a male or a female? Male. Now they, they asked if you, this, this male asked if you needed a lift. Yes. Uh, and you asked for what? To use his cell phone. Okay. And were you given the cell phone on the side of the road? No. What was what was the response back? Um, I really don't remember. I know he told me to get into the car. Okay. Was it conditioned on using the phone? Yes. I could okay. use his phone if I got into the car. Okay. Uh, and when when you were standing outside the vehicle, did you actually see a cell phone somewhere in the car? Yes. Where was it? <clears throat> in the passenger seat. Okay. Now you're pretty savvy. I mean, you're a young lady. Do you remember if it was a kind of a flat smartphone or a flip phone or? Yeah, it was a flip phone. A flip phone. Yep. Okay. Now, um, did you get in the car? Yes. And uh, when you got in the car, what happened? Um, I don't really remember the conversation. I remember as we were turning onto Green Creek, I asked to use the phone. And wait, can I back that up? Yes. 
um, when I got in, he rolled up the window and locked the door. And I asked him to roll the window back down and I didn't mean to be rude. And he rolled the window back down. Or I don't remember. But he asked, or I asked if I could use his phone. And he said, no. And then just stared at me and I asked to get out of the car and for him to stop the car. Let me stop you, I'm sorry. Let me stop you right there. Did okay. You, did, was there a reason why he, he couldn't use the phone? Oh, it was dead. Okay. So this male told you you couldn't use the phone because it was dead. Yes. But didn't say any of that when you were standing outside of the vehicle. Correct. All right. Now, you you made the turn back onto Green Creek. Yes. Was that the direction? Or, let me ask you this. Did you tell this this male where you wanted to go and, and no. you, okay was that the direction you wanted to go in no okay now you indicated that once he told you the phone was dead what happened with the cell phone i don't remember okay fair enough and uh you indicated and i, I didn't mean to cut you off but you You're indicated fine. that uh this male was staring at you yes so that Describe how that made you feel. Creeped out. I wanted to get out of the car. All right. Did you, in fact, ask to get out of the car? Yes. And what happened? He just kept going and stared at me, but he was slowing down. Okay. Then what happened? He reached under his seat and grabbed a gun. Okay. And pointed it at me, and I unlocked the door and jumped out. All right. Now, this gun, could, could you describe it? Had a, it was just like a little handgun, and it had an orange tip on it. All right. I'm sure you're not a gun expert, is that right? Nope. Okay. Uh, did you know whether, if I asked you, well, I'm not going to ask you that question straight then. So, gun's pointed at you. Yes. What's going through your mind? To get away from him. All right. Did the car ever stop? No. When I, after I jumped out, it stopped. All right. Good answer to a bad question. When you asked the car to stop, did it ever stop? No. Did you say anything about stopping the car after the gun was pointed at you? No. All right, what did you do? Just jumped out. All right, what happened to you? Um, I was running down the road and screaming for him, please not to kill me. And then after I was far from him, he told me it was just a joke and he was just kidding. And then I ran to a stranger's house. Okay. As you're running away, did you get a chance, did, did you know whether or not this, this male got out of the van? Yeah, I looked behind me. Okay, what did you see when you looked behind you? Him standing there with the gun pointed at me. What were you worried about? Save, or getting away from him. You think you were going to get shot? Yeah. Did you feel that gun was real? Um, I don't really know. I, okay. really, I wasn't really processing that at the I time. Understand. You were scared? <laughs> yes. You just wanted to get away? Yeah. Okay, I want to show you a couple of, of exhibits here, okay? Bear with me, let me... This is People's Exhibit 42. <coughs> Do you recognize this photograph? Yes. Does that look like the man that, <coughs> that, like Sorry. You get, then, that you got inside? Yes. Okay. I also want to show... You had talked about some black netting, is that right? Correct. All right, I want to show you what's marked as People's Exhibit 42. You recognize that? Yes. What did you count for? The purpose of the last 42. 43. 43. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. 43. I'm having trouble reading my own writing. Uh, 43. Does this look like the netting you saw in that, in that vehicle? Yes. And where was that located? Between the passenger and driver's seat. Okay. Under the ground. Talk about your injuries here in just a second. I want to show you something else. This is People's Exhibit 77. Give me one second.
All right, People's Exhibit 77. First of all, the, the gun itself, do you recognize that? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> How about that orange cap? Does that yes. look familiar? Yes. Does that look like the orange cap you saw? Yes. And just so we if you could point to it on the screen behind you, just so the jury can hear it. Right here. Use that. To the orange? Yeah, this? the orange cap that you saw. That? Yes. Okay. Now, as a result of um, jumping out of this moving vehicle, did you suffer any injuries? Yes. Well, first and foremost, before I get to that, you indicated you ran to a house. Yes. Uh, how far do you think you had to run to get to that house? Not very far. Okay. And was somebody home? Yes. All right. And did that person help you? Yes. Ultimately, did that person call the police? Yes. Okay. <coughs> um, and did a deputy come out and talk to you? Yes. And did you describe to the deputy everything that happened to you? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's go back to People's Exhibit 44. What is this a picture of? My forearm. All right. I mean, was this one of the injuries you suffered from jumping from that car? Yes. All right. People's Exhibit 45. Is that one of the injuries, or what are we looking at there? My back side. I'm sorry. My back side. Okay, and is this a photograph of another injury you suffered as from jumping from that car? Yes. People's Exhibit 46. What are we looking at in this photograph? My back. Lower back. Okay. Shoulder area? Oh, yeah. That's my shoulder. Okay. And again, <laughs> is this an injury you suffered from jumping from that moving vehicle? Yes. People's Exhibit 47. What are we looking at in that photograph? Pretty sure that's my back again. All right. And is this an, another injury you suffered from jumping from that car? Yes. All right. I want you to take a look at People's Exhibit 49. particular that that article right there yes would you recognize that yes what is that my acrylic nail one of your fingernails yes okay and again I just want you to point it out to me for something if you could please All right. now uh, you talk to a deputy yes and you remember talking to a detective named Matt Schultz? Yes. And when you spoke to Detective Schultz, did you provide, well, I guess, what did you provide to Detective Schultz? Um, a description of him and the car, or the van and inside the van. Okay. Is it safe to say you got a pretty good look at the gentleman who was driving that vehicle? Yes. And you're not mistaken about who that was? No. And, uh... This is the same gentleman that pointed the gun at you? Yes. Okay. Now, do you recall, um, do you recall Detective Schultz showing you a series of photographs? Yes. Okay. And were you able for Detective Schultz to point to a person in that series of photographs who was the individual driving that car? Yes. Okay. Give me one second. Welcome back to Law News Network. I'm Heather Hansen here with Ron Blitzer, and we are watching that that teenager and just marveling at her piece, you know, her her ability to testify without getting upset and getting rattled. And she really did a fabulous job on the stand, don't you think? Absolutely. And remember, 
it's not just that she's reliving this whole thing while she's giving her account. He's sitting right, right there. Absolutely. She has to identify him in court. So she's telling this whole story about this traumatizing event that happened to her while the while the man who she says did it is like several feet away. It's really incredible. Well, and, it, and it's unbelievable because not only is the man she says do it, did it that close, but she also now knows what he is accused of having done. Right. You know, what it's not he like he just was of. creepy that day. She now knows that he is really, I mean, allegedly, Alleg yes. a, a really, really capable of some really terrible things. And, and to be testifying with such uh, just peace of mind and, and the ability to, to tell her story clearly is just out of this world. And we'll go back and watch some more of her testimony. But we were talking a little bit about the defense case here because, you know, the prosecution has so far put on a very step-by-step -step case and you sort of know what to expect. We'll hear more about the cell phones, I'm sure. We'll hear more about some of the other cases that are involved here, I'm sure. But what's the defense going to do? And one of the questions we always ask here at Law News, Ron, is do you think he's going to testify? Are we going to hear from Jeffrey Willis himself? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't I don't. Think I don't so. think we're going to be hearing much from Jeffrey <laughs> Willis in this trial. Uh, remember, yeah, he's got another trial after this right. uh, for this kidnapping and another murder. Uh, I don't think we're going to be hearing from him in either trial. Uh, the allegations against him are so terrible mm. and so plentiful mm -hmm. that. I don't think that his attorneys are going to want the jury to hear from him at all. They're uh, going to try to put their best defense forward and uh, say, no, it wasn't him. He wasn't the guy. It was Kevin Bloom. Uh, Willis, you know, had nothing to do with this. And just let that speak for itself and not let Willis speak at all. Well, and let's talk a little bit about Kevin Bloom. So we were talking about this, too, during one of the breaks. When do you think we'll hear from Kevin Bloom? When do you think we'll hear from Kevin Blush? Um, I don't know when we'll hear from Kevin Bledge. Uh, that could be uh, towards the end of the prosecution's case or maybe as a rebuttal witness, uh, mm -hmm. should that be necessary. Because, uh, you know, if the defense calls Kevin Bloom, uh, my guess is he could be, you know, either right at the beginning or right at the end of mm -hmm. their case, right. depending on how they want to orchestrate that, because, you know, that's going to be a big deal. Uh, you know, there was supp supposedly a relationship between the two uh, Kevins that they knew each other from a club of some sort. And then uh, there are also uh, rumblings that Bloom had been Facebook stalking Rebecca Bletch and that his kids and the Bletch's ch children played soccer together. Right. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, that could work towards the defense, but at the same time, I'm very interested to see, like, in this area, it seems like everyone knows each other. The, right, remember, right. the couple who found Rebecca Bletch knew her and recognized her. So yeah. just the fact that Bloom knew these people doesn't necessarily mean anything. And it's, it reminds me of Holly Bobo in that everybody knows everyone. Exactly. And then also, it, and it's, you know, it's similar to Aaron Hernandez, so many cases that we've seen where you've got this other person that they're trying to blame, and that other person, even in Toledo, that other person is testifying, and the defense has the opportunity to cross-examine that person. And really, that's the key to the case. You know, that's the key to whether or not the defense is going to be able to put that little seed of reasonable doubt in any one of the jurors' minds. So I would think that the two Kevins, if the prosecution doesn't call them, that the defense would have to call both of them to establish this theory that they're trying to establish. Um, and because of that, don't you think it would be smart for the prosecutor to call them? Uh, yeah, that could also work for the prosecution as well because any questioning that you can do on the person who the defense says is the guy in this case mm -hmm. uh, works for the prosecution because if you can set anything up to impeach or poke holes in the defense's case and say, oh, no, this guy wasn't there. This guy had nothing to do with it. Yeah, they know each other, but so what? Right. That's going to work for the prosecution. Yeah, and that's why it was so important that the Secret Service, that's one of the things that Kathy, our trial producer, sort of pointed out to us via our, our emails that, you know, that's a really important thing, that there's nothing in the cell phones um, to tie, you know, text messages or phone calls is what he was able to sort of track to tie those two together. And so it's going to be interesting, as you pointed out, you know, soccer teams, 
friends and some sort of club, is that enough to establish that they actually had enough of a relationship to have planned this type of a murder? And um, so far, it's not looking like it would be, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, there's a long way to go in this trial. Uh, you know, sometimes you see in the prosecution's case, the defense is doing a really good job of poking holes and building their case already. We're not seeing that here, but that doesn't mean they don't have something coming up. Well, and that's the difficult thing for the defense because, you know, you tell juries when you open that you, you know, you have to wait and decide at the end and listen to all evidence, but it's almost impossible, and we see that with our chat rooms, that it's impossible to sort of hold off on judgment until the very end. Let's go back and watch the end of our minor witness's testimony, the hero of this case, and, um, you know, continue to see just her, her strength of mind and also how, how anything that she said could possibly be sort of uh, used against the prosecution's case during closings. Because remember, each witness, as you're acting as an attorney, you have to try to collect something from each witness to refer to in your closing to tie your case together. And I don't know that she gave him very much, but you be the judge at the last bit of her testimony. MJN is the person that did all this to you on that day, April 16, 2016. Is that person in the courtroom? Yes. Would you point him out and describe him, please? Right there in the suit and glasses. Your Honor, let the record reflect the witness has identified the might want to be a little bit more specific. Oh, yeah, you, you got two guys with suits and glasses. <laughs> Sorry. What, what color tie? Yellow. Yellow? Yeah. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. The uh, attorney's Just a few more. I just want to make sure I understood your testimony. Your, your testimony was on this day in this particular situation, uh, you were lost. Yes. And even before my client came upon you, uh, you were feeling anxious. Yes. Upset a little bit. Yes. And you, I would imagine how long you've been up at that point. I don't know. Okay. Long time. But, but you hadn't slept the night before. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Um, he, you, you mentioned that when my client uh, uh, stopped and asked if you needed assistance, he, he suggested you get into his vehicle. Yes. Okay. Where, what was around you at the time? Were, were, you, were you by a mall? Were you out in the middle of nowhere? Were you? I was by a whole bunch of woods and then houses on this side. Okay. And, and did you see any stores, any gas stations around? No. All right. So he, so you climbed into his vehicle. Yes. And he, he rolled the windows and locked the door? Yes. Okay. And then you said, go down the window? Yes. And you rolled down the window? Yes. Okay. And you were, un, you were able to, to uh, um, open the door when you, when you decided to jump out? After I unlocked it, yes. You were able to unlock yes. it? Yes. Did you try to lock it again as you, as you locked it? No. You said you wanted to get out? Yes. Was he traveling down the road at the time? Yes. And, it, and was there... I, I've never been on this road. Is there like a, a, a side? A, There's, a, I think a little ditch right there. Okay. And just woods. But is there a side where you can pull off and... and no. Okay. That's, okay. And it, am I correct that I wasn't there at the prelim? I'm, I'm wondering, um, do you know what an airsoft gun is? Yes. Okay. Can you remember mentioning at the prelim that it, it was an airsoft gun that was pointed at you? Yes. Okay. And is that still accurate? Is you, is it no. Is not? It wasn't accurate then either. It wasn't accurate then? No. And the prelim was how long ago? I don't know. It was months ago? Yeah. It was closer to the event than this is, correct? Yes. And that, and you made those statements under oath then, correct? Yes. And you said it looked like an airsoft gun, correct? Yes. And you mentioned that the, the orange tip thing that you pointed out yes. was attached to the gun, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And do you... It doesn't seem like a silly question. Do you know the difference between a gun and a syringe? Yes. Okay. A syringe is like a needle that you inject. Yes. And stuff, yes. And you know the difference. Yes. And this wasn't a syringe that he had in his hand. I don't know. Or no, he didn't have a syringe in his hand. Okay. No. Were you injected with anything? No. Did, were you touched? No. I, I mean, other than your injuries, but you weren't touched by him. No. Right. Correct. Prior to uh, the defendant pulling the gun on you, uh, did he comply with you? Did he comply with your request just to stop the car? No. There, was there anything around you 
mean, North Green Creek's kind of a desolate area, right? Correct. Not a lot of traffic? Nope. Was there any cars around you? No. Any reason why you couldn't stop? Nope. And um, once the gun is pulled, is your focus kind of on that gun at that point in time? Yeah. I took I it mean, out. Yeah. If, if there was anything else in the vicinity, whether it be a syringe or anything else, would you have even seen it? No. And in order for you to essentially leave the car, you had to jump out of the car? Yes. And it was still moving? Yes. Uh, in fact, did you lose your shoes as a result of yes. running? Yes. Yep. That, that the the orange cap that I showed you in that photograph, that's what you, when you say orange tip, that's what it looked like. Yes. Uh, nothing else, Judge, thank you. When you fell, now, did you fall, did your shoes come off that time or did they come off when you started running away? When I started running. Thank you. You're welcome. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the testimony of what is tr who is truly the star of this trial, that young girl um, who really you know, led, ev led the law enforcement officers to Jeffrey Willis, which then allowed them to investigate not just this murder, but also the other cases that are, that are pending against him. Um, we talked about this a little bit before, but what did you think of that cross-exam? It wasn't all that effective in, <coughs> sorry, in my opinion, uh, the attorney was trying to do what best he could under the circumstances, uh, trying to maybe impeach her memory, impeach her, not so much her credibility because didn't really uh, go after her personally, right, right. Uh, but just try to say, oh, well, are you sure it wasn't this? Are you sure it wasn't that? Do you know this? And there was a little bit of that, but he didn't go after her too hard, which I think is a smart move. Absolutely. Because when you're dealing, I uh, touched on this a little bit earlier, when you're dealing with the alleged victim of, of a horrible crime, if you're going after them and badgering them too much, the jury's going to turn on you. Yeah, absolutely. And it looked like that he was trying to establish that, sure, he was just giving you a ride home, this creepy guy with a cell phone that didn't work and who's also been tied to all of these other uh, murders. But I guess that's all he really had to do. And so he just did the best he could with the witness that he had. Right, but that plays right into the prosecution's hands. Because remember, He's not on trial right now for what he did or tried to allegedly do to her. Mm -hmm. That comes later at a different date right. and a different trial. All this needs, all the prosecution needs from this right now is to show that this is the same guy who had the same van in this case, which led prosecutors to getting the evidence they needed to charge him for the current case for Rebecca Bletcher's murder. So you could say all you want, oh, he didn't mean to kidnap you or assault you. He was right. just giving you a ride. Well, sure. But if you establish that he was giving her a ride, That's right. that connects him to this. Yeah, and I think some of the chatters were saying that too, almost like he, they, they were acquiescing that yes, he gave her a ride, which sort of then plays into the prosecutor's hands. It's interesting. Kathy made a point on, was in, well, during that break that we were watching that clip, that Kevin Bloom may plead the fifth. Given all of these allegations against him and the fact that he was just in court yesterday in his own case, I'm surprised, Ron, and I want to get your take on this, uh, do you think the prosecution has tried to make a deal with him? Or do you think they don't have to because they have so much other evidence? Uh, if you really believe in your case against Jeffrey Willis, mm -hmm. then I would imagine you at least offer a deal to Kevin Bloom. If you're not entirely sure what Bloom's role That's, may yeah, or may not have point. been, point. then you may not want to let him off the hook just yet because he could have been involved in all this. He could have been, even if he wasn't the guy to commit these crimes, if he was instrumental in orchestrating them, or if he did things himself that were equally or almost equally as horrible, then you're not going to want to give him a deal. But we don't know what the prosecution believes about him just yet. Right. So that remains to be seen. You know, he well, had his hearing in the, for the other case yesterday, and the judge didn't grant him his motions on that. So there's clearly a case against him.
Uh, I'm not familiar as much with the charges against mm -hmm. him as with Jeffrey Willis, but if they're bad, then that could be why. Well, and it seems like they're trying to keep the pressure on because he had he had initially indicated that perhaps he knew where Haringa's body might be. Mm -hmm. Now, yesterday, uh, he sort of seemed to back off on that. Well, his attorney seemed to back off on that a little bit. But if prosecutors think that he has information that he's not relaying, then they may be continuing to put the pressure on. But Kathy's point is well taken, that there's a good chance that we will not hear from Kevin Bloom in this case because he will plead the fifth, which will make it all the more important to call and cross-examine and really get the Kevin Blesch will be the other key witness here in order to establish credibly that his relationship with Bloom was not such that they would put together a murder of his wife. Yeah, uh, you know, there were reports that uh, Kevin Bletch and his wife Rebecca had had an argument of some sort before uh, her death. Uh, whether or not that ended up playing into her death is something that the defense is probably going to want to look into. But so far from the evidence that we're seeing, uh, I'm not convinced. And from what I've read about this case before the trial started, I'd be surprised. But again, the defense hasn't presented their case yet. We don't know what they're going to say. They could have plenty of evidence that could have me saying the exact opposite in a few days. That's right. Good, good man. Keeping your <laughs> mind open just like we ask you to do. That's fabulous. We're going to now take it to the other hero in this case, and that is the um, the woman who found that young minor and, and helped her after this uh, kidnapping situation happened. So let's listen to her testimony, and then we'll be back. Well, yeah, it was a... Uh, uh quiet morning at first and I was sitting out drinking my coffee and all of a sudden I had heard um, a man and a woman arguing and um, it's very quiet where I live so that was very unusual for me and it was kind of off in the distance at first and then I heard it get louder and my dog started barking because they then noticed that there was a louder noise and the young um, the woman her voice started getting closer and closer. So I got up off of my deck and went in to the house, and I looked out the window, and I saw um, the, a young lady running down the road, on the west side of the road, in front, in front of my house, um, screaming, help, help, he's got a gun, he's got a gun. And so I, you know, I got, went to my front door, and I just opened up my screen door just slightly, and let her know I was home. She didn't know which house to come to. My house would have been the first one that she would have seen. And so I just, come on, come on, come on, let her know to come in. And so she was running down the road, and she didn't have any shoes on, and she was hysterical and frantic, and she ran up my driveway and ran into the house, and I immediately closed the screen door, slammed my front door, and um, she was just, she was hysterical. She was terrified. Let's, let's talk about her demeanor. demeanor. Uh, first and foremost, was this a, a young girl? Yes. Okay. And uh, you kind of have described her demeanor, but in, in some respects, can you let the jury know exactly what you observed of her as far as how, how she was acting and what she was doing? Well, she was screaming. She said, help, help, he's got a gun, he's got a gun. And she said that the whole way she was running down the road and up towards my house, up, the, up right up the driveway. And then, um, I mean, she was disheveled um, when she came in. She, you know, I, I got her, obviously hysterical, I got her into the back bedroom. Um, she had a scratch, I'm not sure which on her, on her arm, which one of her arms had a scrape on it, and I noticed a scrape on her back, and some of her hair had fallen out on the floor, so she was just a wreck, and she was, she was terrified. So I got her in the back bedroom, and she, um, and closed the door to the bedroom, and she, she literally wanted to climb under the bed. She was terrified, so she wanted to get under the bed, and uh, she kept saying, he has a gun, he's had a gun, what are you doing, call the police, and she was just hysterical, and so I, I, I didn't have my phone with me, I had left it out um, near in my kitchen, so I left her, and she was screaming, and my dogs were barking, it was chaos, and I went out and I grabbed my phone, and I called 911, and then had called at that point, and she, Okay. Yeah. So it's, I mean, did it appear to you to be real panic, real fear? Oh, yeah. She was definitely panicked, afraid. She wanted to get away from the situation. I couldn't calm her down. I kept trying to get her to sit down and relax and take some deep breaths, and she just couldn't do that. And I, wanted, I offered her water just to, just to kind of get her to calm down, and she just wouldn't. And, um, of course, 
the fact that she said somebody had a gun made me a little nervous too. So I was um, kind of looking out to make sure we didn't have anybody running up the driveway after her. But um, yeah, she was she was definitely in hysterical in hysterical state of mind. So you had indicated initially you heard two voices. I did. I uh, heard a man one and voice a woman. Got louder. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever see the the origin of the second voice? I did not. When I opened my door, I, because she said he had a gun, I was very cautious and just wanted her to know I was home and to come inside and just close the door. Okay. Now, uh, I think you indicated you ultimately got to your phone. Certainly, I don't know what word you heard. He said 2400 North Great Creek, please come immediately. We have a man that can just. Okay, first and foremost, before I finish playing this, is that your voice? Yes. Two four zero Well, 
I think so, yeah. 
Welcome back to Law News Network. I'm Heather Hansen here with Ron Blitzer, and we have been watching during this lunch break the testimony of both the um, kidnapping victim and the woman who helped her and discovered her. Really compelling testimony today for these jurors, don't you think, Ron? Absolutely. This is definitely one of the days that will be among the highlights of the trial for the jury and for those of you watching and those of us commentating on it. Uh, you have the really compelling testimony of this teenage girl. She's 17 years old. She was 16 at the time right. that Willis allegedly kidnapped her or tried to kidnap her. And she's going through this entire ordeal uh, before the courtroom describing uh, what happened right beforehand, what happened during, what happened when she escaped from the moving vehicle and then ran away fearing for her life. She looked at images of her own yes, graphic yeah. injuries and had no problem just saying, yep, that That's was my me. Shoulder. That's my shoulder. <laughs> Uh, very impressed with her yeah. composure during all of this. Yeah, she was she was just a fabulous witness and, and definitely will be one that we will hear about, I am sure, during the prosecutor's closing and probably not so much during the defense's closing because they're not going to want to focus on her too much. Now, we have a situation here where the judge has said that they'll come back at 1 o'clock until 1.30 and then they're going to take another break because the judge has some sort of uh, other obligation. You know, these trials, there's sort of no getting around stopping and starting because of judges' uh, schedules and jurors' schedules and so forth. Do you think it makes it more difficult or do you think that the jurors are so invested in the case that these little breaks don't really matter all that much? I think it varies from case to case and what has been going on in the trial beforehand. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be that much of an issue today because the jury got to hear some really great stuff. Mm -hmm. So they're keyed in. So they'll have a break for lunch. They'll come back. They'll take another break. They'll be fine. I think if this had been uh, a drier day right, a DNA where day. it was a DNA day, right, yeah. um, if it was all cell phone data, mm -hmm. uh, something that's really technical, then they'd be exhausted. Every break they get, when they come back from the break, they're just going to be thinking about the next break. Right, so right. I think here it's not going to be that big of a problem. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Well, we're waiting for them to come back to the courtroom. We expect them to be back from their lunch break anytime. And who knows, maybe the judge was able to resolve his issues over the lunch break, and we won't have that extra break. In the meantime, though, I want to take you back to the beginning of this case because Rebecca Blush's co-worker testified. She was the very first witness. And I want you to watch this testimony as we sort of talk about Rebecca and her relationship with her husband and whether or not that's going to come into play even more once we hear from the defense in this case. I want to thank you, Ron, for being with me for this lunch break. You certainly were helpful and have some great insight to this case. I want to remind everyone at home to watch for Ron's articles on this case because he posts them on Law News regularly. Whenever there's something big to update, you go ahead and do so, right? Yep, I have an article up already about uh, the testimony that we heard earlier from the kidnapping victim, alleged kidnapping victim. Uh, uh, so you can go and read that, and every day I'm posting a brief recaps of the trial. Yeah, so that's great. If you aren't able to watch it, watch Ron's uh, bylines, and you will be caught up for sure. So thank you, Ron, for being here with us. We're going to watch a little bit of the victim's co-worker, and we'll be back as soon as they're live in the courtroom. Now, um, could you describe, uh, if you can recall, uh, you know, was, it a, was, was there anything out of the ordinary with her day? Uh, did she seem to be in okay mood? Yep. Uh, were you, outside of being co-workers, were you the type of person that you know, you would confide with one another? I mean, we talked, yes, but we didn't go out after work together. Oh, I, 